Hopefully you brought your Bible with you. If you didn't bring a Bible, don't worry about it. We're going to put it up on the screen, or maybe you've got your, your uh, device. But uh, if you have that, turn to Mark chapter 5. If you've been with us since the beginning of 2022, and I hope you have, uh, we have been taking an excursion through this beautiful, transfixing gospel. I hope that you're enjoying this study, you're enjoying this adventure, you're learning things, you're being inspired by things. Maybe some things are confronting you, and that's kind of cool too. Uh, but uh, however God is speaking to you, we're grateful for the opportunity to go through this beautiful, beautiful gospel together. And today, uh, if you're a new kid on the block and you're jumping on the train, hey, jump on the train. We haven't left the station very far. As you can see, we're just in Mark chapter 5. You can catch up with us and, uh, and, and hop on and, and away we go. So uh, I don't know when we'll be done with Mark uh, chapter 16, that's the last one. Uh, it may be Jesus might come back before then, and, uh, but that's okay. How many of you say that would be okay with me? Amen. So uh, we're glad that you're here today. This is a great day. Um, I would love for you, if you can, to stand with me in reverence for the Word of God. Pick a screen. We're putting the same thing up there. Uh, but this is Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. It's a little bit lengthy. Give it good energy today. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, and he turned around in the crowd and he asked, who touched my clothes? Take a breather right there. That's breather time. Okay, here we go, back in. You see the people crowding around you, against you? His disciples answered. And yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering." While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. Say that one more time. Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kaum which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know where the, about this and told them to give her something to eat. God bless you, you may be seated. Thank you so much for that. How many of you know if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, amen? We believe in the Word of God. I think there's some other people here who believe that as well. Hey, a group of us from New Beginnings uh, went to this location just a few months ago. And I wanted to show you some pictures 
uh, real quick, of Capernaum. Here we are standing in Capernaum. Capernaum means city or village of Nahum. Remember Nahum, one of the, we would refer to as the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, I don't know, this guy just walked up. I don't know him from Adam, but uh, <laughs> clearly a... Clearly a photo bomber. And uh, anyway, uh, here we are going in. Second? Oh, I brought my cat toy with me too. Uh, anyway, here we go. Okay, next picture. This is the synagogue, okay? This is the Capernaum synagogue. This is where Jesus taught all of those things. When there was the man with the withered hand and all of these kind of things, guy that's demon-possessed, all that happened here in the Capernaum synagogue. This is on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Next. This is a view from Peter's house, which is, of course, closer to the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. This is the synagogue that we just showed you a picture of. And these are the very, very good, pristine ruins of the homes around Capernaum. Next picture. Here, more of the ruins. You can see all of the walls. You can see doorways. Uh, you can see all kinds of that. It's beautifully, beautifully preserved. Next. Here's the spot right here. Right across from the uh, Capernaum synagogue, this is the area where Jairus would have lived. Okay? Jairus was not the pastor. J uh, Jairus was not a, a Pharisee, but he was a religious, a very trusted individual. He would schedule readers for their services. He would make sure that the scrolls that they read were well taken care of. He took care of that property. And it is, uh, makes a lot of sense. And most theologians and archaeologists believe that it would have made sense. He would have lived right across the street or alleyway, if you will, from the synagogue. And so what we're talking about today is Jesus coming from the Sea of Galilee and He is moving towards this location right here. Somewhere in that place is where Jesus healed and raised the little girl. Next. This is a beautiful porch. I don't know if I've shown you this before, uh, but this is in Magdala. Magdala is where Mary Magdalene was from. This is a little stone's throw down the coast from uh, Capernaum. In Magdala, this amazing excavation site. And in this church that's been erected there, down in the basement, is this print. And I think it's such a beautiful depiction of the woman with the issue of blood. Here we can see this is Jesus, this is the cloak, the rabbinical cloak, some tassels hanging down, and here, right here, that hand of desperation reaching out to touch Jesus Christ. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful print? Yeah, and so we're so blessed that we've been able to go to this place and to kind of put this more in a context. But what I want to do in my time that I've got remaining with you today is look at some excavation of truth, some things that we can somehow dig out and take from, in a very practical way, this text today. And so, I hope you're here to take some notes. I got an all right and oh my, and why did he have to ask that? And uh, anyway, I, again, I, don't, I, I think people who take notes get the best seats in heaven. I can't prove that from this book, but uh, anyway, I hope that you not only take notes, but you take your notes home. You don't line the birdcage with it. You actually put it somewhere where you're going to see it, and then go over these things again. Here's the first thing, you note takers, I want you all to catch, is that the best ministry happens as you go. The best ministry happens as you go. A lot of people, and I believe everybody here today, if I ask for a hand count, how many of you believe that you want to glorify Jesus Christ in your life. I believe there would be probably a, a, a pretty good representation there. How about you? Right? I want to bring Him glory. I know I'm here for a reason. I know that part of the reason is Jesus and me serving people. That my mission in life is to know God and to make Him known. I want to be used. How many, amen. A few, a few of you. You want to be used by the Lord. But a lot of times we're asking the Lord, take us from a a stationary position, and use us. Now, God will do that. God will call your name. God will make you restless. God will give you a sense of rawness where it's like, okay, God, I'm available. You want me to go here? You want me to go there? Th that works. But you know what I read most of all in the New Testament and even in, in practicality is that as you're serving God, as you're moving, as you're going, that's when most likely and most often the Spirit of God will hit you and like a wind in the sail will move you into a, a different direction. 
It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. If somebody is moving, if somebody was moving across this stage right now, and in my frustration, as they're moving across, I just kind of gave them a very little nudge, they would move. They would fall off. That would all be on the internet. We would sell it to America's Funniest Home Videos, and we would build a different addition to the church. It would be amazing! But it's much easier, even according to the law of dynamics and physical law, that a person that's standing still is much harder to push. Most of the time when you find with Jesus, Jesus is in motion, as He has been in these last several weeks together, and as He is in one place, God tells Him to do something else. Jesus is in motion. How about you? How about you? Are you in motion obeying the Lord? One of the most worthless times I've ever felt in my life was earlier last year when some family came up from Wachula and family before they came from California. We went over to Lakeland and we went to an escape room. Anybody know what an escape room is? I have never felt so useless in my entire life. There, I'm so grateful I had some really clever people with me. And if you don't know anything about escape rooms, you go to these places, you go in a room, you pay money to be there. Uh, each room has a theme, and you have to figure out the clues. And as you get the clues, accumulate the clues, smarter people than me, put that together. We got the key, and the key takes us in another room. Well, that has a different theme, and so we brainstormed together. Uh, again, I offered nothing to the team, but uh, they were amazing. And, and, and so we go into the other room, and you get in the other room, and then the other room, guess what? you got to look at the clues, evaluate everything, every detail, and then you get to go into another room. Well, that's a dumb example, but <laughs> it's kind of what we do. That as we go by faith into a room of obedience... As God calls us to do something, as God calls us to people, as God calls us to do one of those many things that, that Rick Joyner just told us about. I love that menu he just gave us. Like, pick off the menu, people. As we go and we uh, recognize that all things done for God's glory are sacred, as we go into a room, guess what? As we're moving, guess what? Typically, that's when the Spirit will say, new room, new room, new room. Who are the people God is using at New Beginnings Christian Church? It's people that are moving. It's people that are always moving, and they're known for that movement. And so, here we see that as Jesus is moving, it opens this opportunity. The second thing I want you to catch is that faith is the ability to see what you cannot see. Faith is the ability to see what you cannot see. The best explainer of the Bible is the Bible. When you go to Hebrews 11, chapter 1, it says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. Scripture also says that we are to walk by faith and not by, by sight. What's beautiful here is the faith that we see. The faith by Jairus. Is there a parent here that would not, if your child got in trouble, not move heaven and earth to get them the help that they need? Right? Some of you have experienced the sting. I can't imagine it. I can't imagine. It's the biggest horror I can ever think of of losing a child. I cannot imagine what that is like. I can't imagine the heart tearing that that is. But here, this man who is respected, who here works and lives with his family right there at the synagogue, here is a guy who knows my daughter is in trouble. And so he's heard about this Jesus. Jesus is a local resident. He's heard about the miracles that have already been done in Capernaum. And so what he does is he humbles himself and he goes to Jesus and he just doesn't leverage his power. Hey, you know I'm the synagogue leader, right? You probably ought to listen to me. I, I'm kind of a big shot around here. Instead, what does he do? He humbles himself. He falls down at the feet of Jesus and tells Jesus, man, my daughter is dying. What did he do? He had a glimpse of what Jesus could do before Jesus actually did it. See, that's faith. Faith is the ability to trust God. Why? Because He's good. Why? Because He does not change. Why? Because He knows what God can do in a life. And so he has a Christ-honoring vision of what Jesus alone can do in his little girl's life. What about that woman with the issue of blood? Twelve years. Twelve years. What does Mark tell us about her? 12 years she's been going to doctors with a problem. 
and nobody can fix her. She has spent all her money, all of her money. But you see, it's not just a financial hardship. It's not just a physical ailment. But this is also relational and societal. Why? Because she at the time, like Jesus, is living under the covering of the Old Covenant. She was a woman who was impure. She had a bleeding issue. What does that mean, Steve? That means that nobody could be around her. That means if she touched anybody, that she would make them ceremonially unclean as well. What does that mean for a mama? I can't touch my kids. I can't touch my grandkids. I can't be with my husband. I have to stand at a distance. As an Old Testament follower, guess what? Anything I sit on has to be discarded and burned. Every bed I lie on has to be discarded and burned. You're poor, you're helpless, you're hopeless, and then you catch wind. Jesus is coming back across the lake. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to do whatever it takes. She had the ability to see what she could not see. For we live by, by faith and not by sight. Here's the third thing if you're taking notes today, is that desperation for Jesus got and gets His attention. They were desperate. They had run out of options. They did everything they know to do, right? I mean, if your daughter is dying and she's knocking on death's door, you're going to do whatever you need to do. If you're poor and you know that there's rules against touching people and all that stuff, you're going to get desperate for Jesus. I love Psalm 42.1. I love it that my mother-in-law played it just a little while ago. That says that as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. Oh my God. Are you desperate? Are you desperate today? Oh yeah, everybody's a spiritual John Wayne again on Sunday morning. <laughs> but are you desperate? Do you live with desperation? Here's, here's the, probably the most telling question is are you here as a critic or a consumer (laughs) people who aren't desperate people who aren't desperate for jesus his mercy his grace people don't, don't know that man i am absolutely interdependent on him guess what not that you would ever do this but they come into church services nice church services like this and though they don't carry a clipboard they're carrying a clipboard They want the worship to be about them. They want the music to be what's nice. They want the environment to be just right. What does it mean? I'm not desperate. Just what I do. I'm conditioned. Where else am I going to go on a Sunday morning? I don't want people calling me. Where where have you been? And so they come. But when we're desperate, guess what? We wear the hat of a consumer. I am here. I need. I need what only Jesus Christ can give me. And this is the most telling thing. Are you desperate for God? These people were clearly desperate. They had no hope apart from a direct encounter with Jesus Himself and Jesus alone. See, to Jesus, people matter most. She was willing to break all the rules. If she touched Jesus, guess what? That would have made Jesus ceremonially unclean. She was a Jewish woman. She could not touch anybody else. Jewish women who were married were not to touch any other men. And you certainly... Don't run the risk of touching a holy man like Jesus. And yet she did. Man, she dove at the feet of Jesus. To do what? To touch just the hem of his garment. To touch the tassels. If you had lived 2,000 years ago in that community, Pharisees and holy people, that when they prayed, they would take those long tassels and they would pray with those tassels. Jesus, remember, he takes the shot at the Pharisees. Man, you guys love to be seen. You just love to be so pious. You make your tassels extra long so everybody is so impressed with you. And here she is going for the tassels. Why? Because it was just a common belief that 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 power would be somehow found in those tassels. And so she's diving, diving down at the feet in the middle of a crowd, risking further injury. But you see, she has this Christ-honoring vision of what Jesus can do for her. What does she know about Jesus that sometimes we forget? People matter most. People matter most. God sent His only begotten Son for people. Not for us just to be religious, but for people. People like you. People like me. I love what Jesus says next. Here, Jesus has 
has had this encounter with the woman. And as he's going, here come some people and they say, hey, don't, don't bug Jesus anymore. Look at the crowd. We, we've got some bad news for you, Jairus. Don't, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your little girl is dead. What historically and currently diminishes your trust in God? This was a litmus test, wasn't it? The worst had happened. The worst had happened. The little girl had died. When the man Jairus goes to Jesus, he's saying she is in the process of dying. And now it has been announced she is, she's gone. Jesus, Jairus. And what is Jesus' response? Don't be afraid. Just believe. What are those things historically? What is your, your Achilles heel? What's the kryptonite in your life that typically, historically, is the hole in the bottom of your faith bucket? <laughs> what is that thing that when you feel amped up about the Lord and man, my faith in Him is, is so strong, what is that thing that you know God knows and sadly Satan knows can trip you up and make all of that faith and all of that confidence and all that trust bippity-boppity-boo disappear? What is it? Is it a report? Is it, is it health? Is it finances? Is it a, a fear of the future? What, what is it? What is that thing that, that, that scares us the most? And, and yet somehow, in the middle of that, I sense that Jesus is saying the same things to our heart that He said to Jairus. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Jairus, you're, you're walking by sight right now. Jairus, man, you were doing so good right up till now. Jairus, I know that this is the litmus test of your faith with this announcement. Jairus, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You can believe. Hang on to your belief. Even in the worst of situations, hang on. Don't be afraid. Just believe. How about this one? And I'm reminded of this. Here, Jesus goes in. Now, back in the day, there were a professional mourners. If someone died in your family, you would employ mourners. Imagine that being your job or a part-time job for you. Imagine that on a business card, you know. We see this, don't we, in some of the news reports of bad things happening over in the Middle East. Very demonstrative, right? In the streets, uh, very demonstrative in their wailing and, and in their mourning. And here, if, when someone died in your family, these people would come and, and man, there would be the playing of loud and piercing flutes and screaming and wailing, this incredible demonstrative thing. And then here comes Jesus. And Jesus comes in and He said, hey, she's just taking a nap. And they laugh. They've seen death. They're employed by death. And yet Jesus said, she's just sleeping. This is a little girl who's just, who's just sleeping. Friends, people will always mock your faith. And as your brother in Christ and as your pastor or a new friend, can I just give you some advice? Is so what? <laughs> so what? Get used to it. If people aren't mocking your faith, if people aren't writing you about your faith, you're probably not exercising faith. Jesus said, man, blessed are those who persecute you because of me. Great is your reward in heaven. Man, rejoice in that. Because in the same way, man, they, they did that to the prophets before you. People are going to mock you when you stand up for Jesus. People think on a beautiful Memorial Day weekend like this, what are you doing in a church building? What are you, what are you doing? We live in Florida for crying out loud. It's beautiful. There's a beach waiting for you right now. And here you are in this... You're, you're, what do you give? What? Every, how often? Every once a year? Every what? Your faith will always get mocked. <laughs> and that's an awesome thing. That's an awesome thing. Get used to it. Jesus said you're going to have trouble in this world. But take courage. Why? I overcame the world. And we're going with Him. I'm rolling with Jesus. How about you? couple more, you note-takers. 
With Jesus, all things are possible. When I read this account, and I've read this account, taught this account so many times, I thought, listen, if Jesus can heal a woman, if Jesus can raise a dead person, the question I first absorb and I now extend to you is what can't Jesus do for you? What can't Jesus do for you? If He can raise dead people, if He can heal a woman who has gone to every human being she knows who might be able to help her, and He can absolutely just... What I love about that, one of the things I love is she goes from desperate to daughter. Did you catch that? He calls her daughter. Here's this woman who has perhaps not been able to touch her daughter or daughters. And here Jesus, in the most endearing thing a daddy can say, daughter. When's the last time somebody called her daughter? She went from desperate to to daughter in this beautiful, beautiful exchange. But what can't he do for you? One of the things I love, and it's such a small piece, but it's so beautiful, is when he raises this girl from the dead, did you catch what he tells the people to do? Feed her. Feed her. Did you catch that? I love that part. Why? Because I like to eat, first of all. But second of all, he doesn't just wake her up enough where she's still in a critical condition. Start her with some jello. <laughs> then we'll go to a harder food, and uh, after a couple of weeks, we'll do this. I mean, He takes her from dead to, I am so hungry. Guys, when we trust Jesus Christ to do things, He not only can take us to where we used to be at our best spot in life, He can take us beyond the best thing we've ever experienced before. Here she comes back to life with an appetite. Fully, fully restored. Fully alive. And that's what He does in life. What can He do for you? Lastly, here's the landing gear is that Jesus alone is the ultimate relationship restorer. Do you catch that? In the miracles and in the exchanges and everything that we just read, and this is a longer text than we usually tackle, but notice that ultimately when we look at this account from 35,000 feet, Jesus is giving these daughters back to their families and back to their communities. He says to this girl, He says to these parents, your daughter's back. Your daughter's back. You had no hope in the world. Here's your little girl again. Can you imagine the rejoicing? You notice how he kicked faith out of the room, by the way? He set an atmosphere of faith. All you guys that are laughing right now, get out. Those who have faith, you can stay. Be a part of this thing. Right? Notice he gives the little girl back to her family. He gives this woman back to her community. Guys, Jesus. Jesus wants to bring you to the Father. It's the most beautiful thing that He does. Nobody, no other individual in the history of the world has the credentiality to lead you to a relationship, a restored relationship with the Father. Sin has broken that relationship. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God is a holy God. God is absolutely incompatible with sin. And yet, through Jesus Christ, through His blood, shed blood on the cross, through His resurrection from the dead, proving that He was exactly who He claimed to be, guess what? We can have blood on our life. Our sins can be forgiven. I don't know who you are or what you've done, but your sins can be removed. Scripture says that He'll throw it into the sea of forgetfulness. And we can have a new start in this life. In a very unpredictable world that we live in, guess what? You can have hope. You can have real hope in Jesus Christ. I hope that you're hoping in something today. We're all hoping for something. I was just meeting with a, a couple out at the drive-in, and they're telling me about all these vacations they've got lined up. And I said, man, isn't it cool to have things to look forward to? They said, yeah, it's really, really neat. Guys, do you look forward to, to heaven? Do you look forward to being with Jesus? Scripture says that one day, mortality rates in Hillsborough County prove they're hovering right about 100%. And someday all of us, no exceptions, your name, picture, are not in the small print at the bottom of the biblical page. We'll stand before a God, a holy 
God who knows everything about us. Every action, every attitude, every thought, every word spoken in anger, disappointment, disillusionment. And we have a choice. We've got a choice right now. I can't promise you tomorrow. I can't promise you 12 o'clock today. But you've got a choice of whose righteousness you're going to stand in when you stand before this perfect judge. Are you going to stand before him in your righteousness? All the good stuff you did? All the time you lent sugar to a neighbor in need? <laughs> mowed, a, mowed a lawn? Hey, those are all great things. Keep doing those things. But those things aren't good enough. Good ain't good enough. Or the choice is you can stand in the righteousness of Jesus. And so the choice is yours on that. Today, he's offering you that. He's offering you mercy. He's offering you grace. And I pray that you'd make the right decision. Today can be the day of salvation. If you'll humble yourself and you'll recognize your need for a Lord and a Savior. Let me pray as the praise team comes back up. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for examples that we read in Scripture of people who put their faith in you who were not disappointed. We thank you, Father, for your ability, even in the seemingly most hopeless seasons and, and events in life, that we can count on Jesus to give us hope. Father, I pray if there's someone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. I pray that they would humble their hearts, that they would reach out to Jesus. Jesus said that who the Father leads him to, he, he'll never reject. And so, Father, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, today we can have hope. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Father that even in death we can have hope. And Father, I pray that each one of us could leave this space or could click off of the website in just a few minutes and know that they're ready. They're ready because they have hope in the one who overcame the worst thing this world could throw at them and came out of the grave. Thank you, Father. I pray that your spirit would move even now. What a good, good Father. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who we love. Amen. Would you stand with me?